After 10 minutes, they uncovered most of Kiowa's lower body. The corpse was angled steeply in the muck, upside down like a diver who had plunged head first off a high tower. The men stood quietly for a few seconds. There was a feeling of awe. Mitchell Sanders finally nodded and said, let's get it done. And they took hold of the legs and pulled up hard, then pulled again. And after a moment, Kiowa was sliding to the surface. A piece of his shoulder was missing. The arm and chest and face were cut up with shrapnel. He was covered with bluish green mud. Well, Henry Dobbins said, it would be it w- could be worse. And Dave Jensen said, how, man? Tell me how. Carefully trying not to look at the body, they carried Kiwa over to the dike and laid him down. They used towels to clean off the scum. Rat Kylie went through the kid's pockets, placed him his personal effects in a plastic bag, taped the bag to Kiwa's wrist, and then used the radio to call in a dust-off. Moving away, the men found things to do with themselves, some smoking, some opening up cans of sea rations, a few just standing in the rain. For all of them, it was a relief to have it finished. There was a promise now of finding a hooch somewhere or an abandoned pagoda where they could strip down and wring out their fatigues and maybe start a hot fire. They felt bad for Kiowa, but they also felt a kind of giddiness, a secret joy, because they were alive and because even the rain was preferable to being sucked under a shit field and because it was all a matter of luck and happenstance. Hazar sat down on the dike next to Norman Bowker. Listen, he said, those dumb jokes, I didn't mean anything. We all say things. Yeah, but when I saw the guy, it made me feel, I don't know, like he was listening. He wasn't. I guess not, but I felt sort of guilty almost. Like, if I'd kept my mouth shut, none of it would have ever happened. Like, it was my fault. Norman Bowker looked out across the wet field. Nobody's fault, he said. Everybody's. Near the center of the field, First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross squatted in the muck, almost entirely submerged. In his head, he was revising the letter to Kiwa's father, impersonal this time, an officer expressing an officer's condolences. No apologies were necessary, because, in fact, it was one of those freak things, and the war was full of freaks, and nothing could ever change it anyway. What, which was the truth, he thought, the exact truth. Lieutenant Cross went deeper into the muck, the dark water at his throat, and tried to tell himself it was the truth. Beside him, a few steps off to the left, the young soldier was still searching for his girlfriend's picture, still remembering how he had killed Kiwa. The boy wanted to confess. He wanted to tell the lieutenant how in the middle of the night he had pulled out Billy's picture and passed it over to Kiwa and then switched on the flashlight and how Kiwa had whispered, Hey, she's cute. And how for a second the flashlight had made Billy's face sparkle and how right then the field had exploded all around them. The flashlight had done it, like a target shining in the dark. The boy looked up at the sky, then at Jimmy Cross. Sir, he said, the rain and mist moved across the field in broad, sweeping sheets of gray. Close by, there was thunder. Sir, the boy said, I got to explain something. But Lieutenant Jimmy Cross wasn't listening. Eyes closed, he let himself go deeper into the waste, just letting the field take him. He lay back and floated. When a man died, there had to be blame. Jimmy Cross understood this. You could blame the war. You could... You could blame the idiots who made the war. You could blame Kiowa for going into it. You could blame the rain. You could blame the river. You could blame the field, the mud, the climate. You could blame the enemy. You could blame the mortar rounds. You could blame people who were too lazy to read a newspaper, who were bored by their daily body counts, who switched channels at the mention of politics. You could blame whole nations. You could blame God. You could blame the munitions makers or Karl Marx or a trick of late or an old man in Omaha who forgot to vote. In the field, though, the causes were immediate. A moment of carelessness or bad judgment or plain stupidity carried consequences that lasted forever. For a long while, Jimmy Cross lay floating in the clouds to the east. There was the sound of a helicopter, but he did not take notice. With his eyes still closed, bobbing in the field, he let himself slip away. He was back home in New Jersey, a golden afternoon on the golf course. The fairways lush and green, and he was teeing it up on the first hole. It was a world without responsibility. When the war was over, he thought maybe then he would write a letter to Kiwa's father, or maybe not. Maybe he would just take a couple of practice swings and knock the ball down the middle and pick up his clubs 
I'm gonna walk off into the afternoon. The things they carried by Tim O'Brien. Good form. It's time to be blunt. I'm 43 years old, true, and I'm a writer now, and a long time ago I walked through Kang Nagi province as a foot soldier. Almost everything else is invented, but it's not a game, it's a form. Right here now, as I invent myself, I'm thinking of all I want to tell you about why this book is written as it is. For instance, I want to tell you this. Twenty years ago, I watched a man die on a trail near the, near the village of Mai Kei. I did not kill him. But I was present, you see, and my presence was guilt enough. I remember his face, which was not a pretty face, because his jaw was in his throat, and I remember feeding the burden of responsibility and grief. I blamed myself, and rightly so, because I was present. But listen, even that story is made up. I want you to feel what I felt. I want you to know why story truth is truer sometimes than happening truth. Here is the happening truth. I was once a soldier. There were many bodies, real bodies with real faces, but I was young, and then I was afraid to look. And now, 20 years later, I am left with faceless responsibility and faceless grief. Here is the story truth. He was a slim, dead, almost dainty young man of about 20. He lay in the center of Red Clay Trail near the village of my cave. His jaw was in his throat. His one eye was shut, and the other was a star-shaped hole. I killed him. What stories can I can do? I guess it makes things present. I can look at things I never looked at. I can attach faces to grief and love and pity and God. I can be brave. I can make myself feel again. Daddy, tell the truth, Kathleen can say. Did you ever kill anybody? And I can say honestly, of course not. Or I can say honestly, yes.